Um, well, good evening and welcome to you all for coming uh, to our first ever annual meeting. Um, I'm Tim Grogan. I think I know most of you. I'm the executive director of OHF. And nobody wishes we could all be together in person uh, more than I do. But uh, Jeanette and I have worked hard to put together a program that we think delivers a lot of the education and hopefully some fun that you're used to at annual meeting. Um, you can see our program for the week on the platform that you got into this session through. Each evening at six, we'll be having a um, themed uh, topic. Tomorrow night, Wednesday is ladies night, although everyone is welcome, but the discussion will center on issues uh, primarily related to women. Uh, Thursday, not to be left out, is men's night. Friday night is uh, will be a little less serious and we'll uh, shift to some fun. We'll have a trivia game uh, with prizes and then we'll watch the movie Bombardier Blood together. Uh, there should have been some popcorn in your goodie box. I hope you all got your goodie boxes. Um, and then Saturday, uh, we'll wrap up with a full day uh, in the morning, we have three hours of kid programming uh, for different three sessions for three different ages. It's done by this great company called Beyond Rec Recreation, uh, which I saw do the HFA summer camp and they're, they're really fun and really good. Uh, if you, any of your kids won't want to miss that Saturday morning. Uh, we'll have three sessions in the afternoon. And then our uh, final program uh, Thursday evening which you, you really won't want to miss. It's the things I'm told are the most popular at annual meeting. We'll have our camp video. We'll have a new video on our scholarship program, which if it doesn't bring a tear to your eye, I, I don't know what will. It's really well done. Then we'll have our annual awards and we'll have our board member recognition, um, which segues into voting. Uh, we vote at our annual meeting for the board members uh, this year, we have to do it online. So on, again, on the platform that you got to this through, there's a, um, a menu item for voting. Uh, please uh, check it out. There's bios of the candidate and you can vote uh, electronically there. That'll be open all week long. Uh, and finally, I'd like to encourage you to visit our exhibit hall. All the uh, uh, good companies who brought us uh, this week and sponsored it. And uh, in the exhibit hall, we have a scavenger game going on. Uh, the, the rules for it are in the, on the prizes menu in the, in the lobby, but uh, there will be prizes uh, when you go through the exhibit hall. There are things to watch for and you can win. Uh, so tonight, I'd like to thank the HTC uh, in general for their generous support of OHF. Um, they're one of our largest donors. I don't know if everyone knows that, uh, but they also contribute uh, very valuable educational resources throughout the year and especially at our summer camp, which they're a vital part of. Uh, I have the honor of introducing Dr. Osmond Khan tonight, who leads the center. Uh, Dr. Khan uh, did a postdoctoral fellowship at Georgetown in a fellowship at Penn State, and then joined OU's Health Science Center as the director of hemostasis and thrombosis program. Uh, his research interests center on improving care and outcomes for patients with bleeding disorders. And as many of you know, uh, that's reflected in all of his dealings with you. Um, so Dr. Khan, I won't take any more of your time. Thank you for being with us this evening. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's really a pleasure to speak to you guys and, and uh, thank you for continuing to invite me uh, every year. And, and I take it as a, a vote of confidence. Um, and certainly these are, I think, strange times uh, with all this COVID. And I hope that next year when we all meet, we'll be able to meet in person. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, Sarah, TJ, Peggy, and I, and uh, we had sort of mulled over what we should talk about. 
Um, and Jeanette had provided some thoughts, thank you so much, about uh, maybe some themes that were on people's minds. And, and so we put this together to sort of go through uh, our, what is our approach um, to treating hemophilia, sort of broad themes, um, a bit about prophylaxis and what the evidence is out there, and, and then after I finish my talk, which hopefully should be about 35, 40 minutes, um, we have a recorded talk from Javay. Unfortunately, he had a prior engagement today that he could not uh, break. And then uh, he uh, has uh, some things about appropriate communication that I think is very helpful. So I'll, I'll start. I, I have no relevant uh, disclosures to this talk. I have served as an advisory capacity. Uh, to a number of companies, but none of that is reflected in today's talk. Um, and I'll go through the objectives of today's talk. So we'll start talking about fundamentals of hemophilia treatment. Um, what severity of patients, how do we approach them in our mindset? We'll talk about what is the evidence for prophylaxis in patients with hemophilia and, and is there a best regimen? There are so many ways to do prophylaxis. We'll talk about the individualization and personalization of treatment. I uh, will speak briefly about non-factor therapies and then really talk about what are the goals of treatment? What are we trying to accomplish? How do we measure those goals? And what is the role of identification of bleeding and why is that important? in clarifying our goals. And so uh, let me start talking about the fundamentals of hemophilia treatment. Now, uh, just in brief, hemophilia is the most severe inherited bleeding disorder with about one in 5,000 male births for hemophilia A and about one in 30,000 male births for hemophilia B. It is an equal opportunity disease that affects all ethnicities in the world relatively equally. And it has been recognized as a bleeding disorder, as a medical entity since biblical times. Uh, and most famously, um, the royal families of Europe uh, were afflicted with hemophilia. Queen Victoria was a carrier for hemophilia B. And uh, Alexei, uh, the son of the last czar, had severe hemophilia B and um, Rasputin used to cure his, uh, his painful episodes. And I don't know how he did that, but that's how he had a lot of control over the job. I want to talk briefly about mild, moderate, and severe hemophilia. So mild patients are patients with factor levels of between six and 50%. Generally, mild patients do not have spontaneous bleeding, and nearly all the incidents of bleeding are either caused by traumatic uh, issues or by invasive procedures or surgery. Oftentimes, these patients are diagnosed later in life or when they are having routine testing before a surgical procedure or they have a procedure and they have excessive bleeding afterwards. Generally, factor replacement is reserved for excessive bleeding with injuries or prior to invasive procedures or bleeding events. And for hemophilia A, but not for hemophilia B, DDAVP can be used in some of these patients as a treatment as well. What about moderate patients? So moderate patients are two to 5% factor levels. And again, they behave clinically quite different than the severe patients. Moderate patients generally do not have spontaneous bleeding. A few of them may, but generally they don't. And most of their hemorrhages occur with injury, trauma, or surgery. About a quarter of the moderate patients tend to display more bleeding patterns, more like the uh, severe patients and tend to have either some spontaneous or minimally traumatic bleeding events. And these are the ones that then need some more aggressive treatment. Generally in moderate patients, factor replacement therapy is given on an as needed basis. However, some moderate patients may benefit from a routine prophylactic 
obstructed replacement. Severe patients. So about half of hemophilia patients roughly are severe patients. And these are identified by 1% or less than 1% factor levels. And really the hallmark of severe hemophilia A and B patients is hematrosis, bleeding into the joints. The most common areas being ankles, knees, and elbows. However, they can have bleeding into any of the deep tissues, any organ, any muscle, really anything, especially with trauma. While musculoskeletal bleeding is more common, some of them may have mucosal type bleeding like epistaxis or heavy periods in carriers, but that is less common. And then really the standard of treatment, and we're going to be talking a lot about that in severe patients is factor replacement therapy, preferably in a preventative and prophylactic fashion. That brings us to the next session, which is what is the evidence for prophylaxis? And whenever I say prophylaxis, that means giving factor on a regular routine without waiting for any bleeding event to happen. Prophylaxis means treating to prevent bleeding effects rather than responding to an event and then treating it. And so again, on demand is treating for events or prior to events. And then prophylaxis is regular preventative bleeding. Uh, sorry, regular preventative treatment. Prophylaxis can be divided into primary and secondary. And primary is generally termed as young patient before either significant bleeding and certainly before any joint damage occurs. And then secondary prophylaxis uh, is initiated after some joint abnormalities or joint bleeding have occurred. Uh, what was really picked up early on was that there's a significant difference in clinical uh, features between severe and moderate patients. So just having a factor level of two to 3% creates a big difference in how patients bleed. And so the uh, initial event or the initial intent with prophylaxis is to change a severe patient to a moderate patient. And the traditional goal of prophylaxis is not to let factor levels go below 1%. So the factor trough is traditionally maintained above 1%. However, with current strategies and current situations, we do have the ability to keep factor troughs above 1%, and we do do that in different situations. What is the evidence for prophylaxis? Really the first, although there were many studies before this, the first prophylactic randomized study, prospective prophylactic randomized study, was the joint outcome study in the US. And uh, what they did was they took young kids and they randomized them with a flip of a coin, half of them were treated with an aggressive on-demand regimen. So they got treatment if they had injuries or before any uh, invasive procedures, and the other half got about uh, 25 units per kilo every other day uh, as a prophylactic treatment. And patients were followed until they were six years of age, and they were assessed by MRIs of their joints. And so there was a significant reduction, 83% reduction in the joint damage assessed by their MRIs. What about their bleeding rates or bleeding events? So I'm going to be using the term ADR multiple times throughout this talk. ADR means annual bleed rate or annual bleeding event. Um, and so ADR is a standard way of looking at how much bleeding is going on. It's far from perfect, but we we'll use it in, in a lot of different trials. So in, with the prophylaxis, there was a dramatic decrease in the ADR. Patients who were getting on-demand therapy were bleeding about 18 times per, uh, per year. ABR is an annual rate. And the ABR fell to three with uh, patients who were on prophylaxis. So that was a significant decrease. One of the interesting things noted in this trial, and, and I 
you know, I don't want um, to go into this graph too detailed, but the, the point of this graph is that although most of the patients who were shown on the MRI to have joint damage also felt that they were having joint bleeds. So they reported ADRs that were elevated and they were seen to have joint damage on the MRIs. But there were some patients, about 14% of patients who had actually quite a bit of MRI damage, but didn't report any bleeds. And so that brings us to the concept of subclinical bleeding and, or silent bleeding. And, and that concept really is that if we don't do prophylaxis, even if somebody doesn't feel that they're having a few bleeding, that's, there are micro bleeds. And the only way to prevent micro bleeds leading to joint damage is to do prophylaxis. So, so that was an every other day regimen. Are there other regimens that have been done? And certainly there are multiple regimens out there. There's a Canadian stepwise regimen that starts with once a week, twice a week, three times a week. And then there are these two regimens that uh, is, one is called the Dutch Intermediate Regimen and one is called the Swedish Malmo High Dose Regimen. And what they did was they were two, these were two populations that in their own countries, everyone was on that regimen. And so they took 20 years of data and compared these two. These are very natural two populations of hemophilia patients who are on these regimens. And so if you look at the Dutch intermediate regimen, that treats about half the dose compared to the high dose regimen. So annual factor use is about 2000 per kilo per year. And then the other one is about 4,000 units per kilo per year. And for a typical adult on the Dutch regimen, he would be on something like a thousand units two or three times a week. And on the Malmo regimen, they'll be on 2000 units at least three times a week. So when they looked at the results, what did they find? So there was a slight improvement with the Dutch regimen, uh, with the high dose Swedish regimen. When they looked at quality of life between these two, it was very similar. These patients were uh, uh, quite, uh, um, you know, they, they were really were not restricted. They had excellent pain control. They were doing very well. When they looked at their joint scores, the scores in the high dose regimen was slightly better. And when they look at their median bleeds, the median bleeds were slightly better, slightly lower in the high dose regimen. And to get to a median bleed of one per year to zero, they had to double the amount of factor. And so really, this was a wonderful comparison of two regimens. And, and it, it, uh, it, um, I think uh, we learned a lot from it. And really, it taught us that the more intensive and high-dose regimen can provide slightly improved outcomes at significant cost of doubling the amount of factor. And they did some cost comparisons between these. And so it was, I think, around $160,000 per year for the intermediate and $280,000 per year for the Swedish high dose regimen. Okay, so what about prophylaxis in adults? You know, mostly I've been talking about kids and adolescents uh, until now. And so really the, the first well done uh, randomized study in adults was called the SPIN-ARC study. And this, so uh, this had a median age of 29 years, some younger, some older, and all these were severe hemophilia patients and they were randomized to either get on-demand therapy or get recombinant um, factor eight at 25 units per kilo three times a week. They saw a 94% reduction in their annual bleed rate. There were 30 bleeds on the on-demand versus two bleeds on the prophylactic uh, arm. And not only just reducing their ABR, the prophylaxis arm ended up in improving function, improving quality of life, improving activity and pain. But, and this is a big limitation, when they did MRIs on these patients, on the MRIs, they did not see a significant difference. And really what that teaches us is that 
if you have severe hemochrosis, if joint damage has already occurred, all the factor in the world cannot reverse it. We can prevent further damage, we can improve function, we can improve pain, can limit other bleeds, but the key is to prevent joint damage in the first place. And if joint damage has occurred, there's still a role for prophylaxis, but there's a limitation on how much it can improve pre-established joint damage. So these were all uh, data on standard half-life products. What about the extended half-life products, things like Iloctate, Dynovate, uh, Jibby, uh, and so on? And so with Factor Eight, there are now four products on the market, and they have managed to increase the half-life of Factor Eight from a standard of 12 hours in adults to about 17 hours. So about so. With 12 hours, factor lasts about two days in the body. With 17 hours, it lasts about three, three and a half days or so. And, and they've published a lot of data that have used a variety of dosing regimens, some twice a week, some every fourth day, every fifth day, or once a week also. And, and I think we really have to individualize these to every patient and figure out which is a good fit for which patient. What about hemophilia B. So uh, prophylaxis in hemophilia B, uh, wonderful study, study uh, published by Dr. Valentino. And this randomized again patients to on-demand versus prophylaxis. And this was a mixed study of both pediatric and adult patients between six and 65 years of age. This study again showed a reduction of ADR by 90%. And the patients who were on demand got about 35 bleeds per year. The patients who were on a 50 unit per kilo twice weekly dose got about two and a half bleeds per year. And the patients who were on 100 kilos, one, units per kilo once weekly got about four and a half bleeds. And in the graph here, you can see, uh, you know, this graph actually what they did was they had, they had patients on on demand then they put them on prophylaxis for a couple of months, and then they again got them back on on-demand. And on both sides, you see these high bleed rates on the on-demand arm, and then between when they were on prophylaxis, you can see their joint bleeds really fell down very nicely. And again, these were a combination of pediatric and adult patients, and in both of them, um, treatment prophylactically was able to reduce their bleeding significantly. Now, the newer extended half-life products, they have a much longer half-life. Factor nine half-life is generally around 18 hours. And with these extended half-life products, um, it has been now extended to 90 and even above 100 hours. And so uh, one nicely done study looking at one of the extended products, uh, glycopegylated factor nine products, and this was again a mix of adolescent and adults, 13 to 70 years of age. And they had an on-demand arm, which had about 16 years. And again, they had two treatment doses. They had a low dose, 10 units per kilo. That's a really low dose, once a week. And even that low dose managed to drop the 16 bleeds per year to about three bleeds per year. And then they had a higher dose arm, about 40 units per kilo once a week. And that dropped it to about one. So there, uh, you know, that's quite dramatic, dropping it from 16 to one. And they actually very nicely showed their factor levels. So these factor levels are all trough levels. These are the lowest level the factor goes on this treatment. And so the line at the bottom, the red one, is the lower dose, the 10 units per kilo, and the blue line on top is the 40 units per kilo. So you can see with once a week, 40 units per kilo of factor nine pegylated, it really stays above 25% for the most part. And most of the 10 per kilo is also staying above 10%. This was a wonderful um, publication which looked at CDC and Athen data sets. And, and looked at the trends of prophylaxis in 
children and adults with severe hemophilia. And unfortunately, I don't, this, this was only until 2010. So I looked at the 11 years from 99 to 2010. But if you look at uh, the graph, the, the lines, the red and blue line here are the, uh, the youngest patients between two and 20 years of age. And if you see that they've gone from all the way to about 50% now to about 75, and some of the new data suggests to about 80%, but that still means that there are 20% of patients in the US with severe hemophilia, children, that are not on prophylaxis, and I think we can do better. If you look at adults, now the green line is young adults, 20 to 30 years of age, and if you can, if you see they went from 5% in 99 to about 40% or so in 2010, and I think today they're above 50% clearly, but, but we have a ways to go. And if you look at older adults from 30 to 70 years of age, clearly less than half of older adults with severe hemophilia are currently on prophylaxis in the US and there's work to do. So let's talk about individualization of therapy. You know, I've talked about lots of these products. I've talked about lots of these regimens. Well, how do you choose what regimen is good for one individual patient and how do we do that? And I really think this, this is a, you know, five, even 10 years back, even five years back, actually, I think this conversation was more simpler. We had a couple of products all with similar half-lives and you had to choose whether you wanted a, a plasma or a recombinant product and that uh, you know, conversation is still there, but I think it's gotten a lot more complicated. So we start by looking what's the patient's joint status. So patients who are doing well and have pretty pristine joints were clearly doing a good job in maintaining those joints and, and they're probably doing okay on their regimen and, and we choose an impaired regimen that works for their lifestyle and try to keep around it. But if a patient, let's say, is developing a target joint and, and if a joint has back-to-back -back two or three bleeds, that, that's a huge red flag. And that joint can become a problematic target joint and rapidly deteriorate. Even though all the other joints are fine, that one joint is having two or three bleeds, the problem is a bleed in the joint is a positive vicious cycle. One bleed makes it more likely for another bleed, makes it more likely for another bleed to happen and so on. And so that patient, you know, to us that tells us, okay, we need to ramp up the dosing immediately. And if their trough is two, three, four percent, we need to raise it to maybe 10, 15 percent for at least a couple of months to calm this joint down. Certainly the age and weight of the patient play a role. Uh, younger patients, what sort of activities they're doing, and we'll talk about activities in a bit. Um, older patients, if they have a sedentary lifestyle, what is the weight of the patient? What is the load on the joints? Does this patient need a more aggressive regimen or this patient is okay with once or twice a week lower type of dosing? Now, physical activity and lifestyle, and I want to go into this a little deeper. Um, you know, I think there are certainly, for starters, we encourage physical activity, both in children and in adults. But there's a certain way to do physical activity, and I think there's no way that we could get around the fact that uh, while low-risk physical activity, like just swimming, walking, and golf, has minimal increase in bleeding events, moderate risk of activity such as running, uh, bowling, tennis, basketball, the risk starts to go up. And the risk may be three times more than a low risk activity. However, we feel that this risk, even though it's associated with some bleeding risk, it, it's, a, it's an acceptable risk and it's transient in nature. And this risk can be mitigated by appropriate prophylactic regimen, and so we, we really encourage activity. However, high-risk activity in which collisions are much more likely, like football or boxing or wrestling, those are really not recommended, and then the ratio of how much risk versus how much benefit 
really starts to go up to too much risk. And those are not recommended by NASAC or by NHF really. I think it's important to know that lack of physical activity in patients with hemophilia is definitely associated with a deteriorating physical condition, loss of coordination, loss of proprioception, and this leads to increased frequency of joint bleeding. And, and there's a lot of data to back that up. On the other hand, we, as we promote joint health by promoting physical activity, uh, it increases muscle strength, it enhances joint stability, it enhances balance, enhances proprioception, the feedback that the body gets, and it does protect against joint weight. In addition to this, building and maintaining adequate bone density is important, and it protects against osteoporosis in later years. And a general active lifestyle will help to promote normal weight, which will reduce stress on the joints, and of course will help a generally active lifestyle and help cardiac health. So those are really all the reasons why I think having an active lifestyle is important, but then depending on what the activity is and what the lifestyle is, the prophylactic regimen is adjusted so that we can appropriately cover. Sometimes patients who've had uh, chronic arthropathy and have developed some scar tissue and are really sedentary. Once they start having some activity, they may sometimes experience a higher number of bleeds because their body's really not used to it until it calms down. So a change in activity is something that we actually take quite seriously and we'll try to respond to it and, and preempt it and increase the intensity of treatment to cover for it and to prevent any joint bleeds, especially as I said, when someone is going from a traditionally sedentary to a more active lifestyle. What about pharmacokinetics? And I'd like to delve into that a little bit in detail as well. Pharmacokinetics means how our bodies utilize factor eight. And so this is, uh, this is actual data. Uh, this is from two patients who with the same dose of factor VIII get about similar recovery. So with the same dose of factor VIII, they're going from about a 1% to about 100%. Now patient A, if you see factor VIII gets out of their system in about two days, about 50 hours. Patient B is taking more than four days and the difference is kinetics of their body. The difference is how one person utilizes factor VIII compared to another person. And I think traditionally dosing has been fixed dosing for patients. And we're really getting away from that. We're really personalizing dosing for every patient based on how they utilize factor and how their body utilizes it and what their troughs are and how long it takes them to do that. Now, there's something called population PK modeling. And I'd like to tell you what that is. Now, uh, and on different studies, you know, they do a PK modeling. Basically what that means, you give a patient a dose of factor and you get lots of factor levels. These involve about 10 to 11 blood draws and you plot them all out to see how their body utilizes factor. Now it's not that simple to get 10 to 11 blood draws on every patient over two, three days. And so where this is where population PK modeling comes in. And basically what this process is, a lot of information regarding actual patients' uh, data regarding uh, their factor levels and their factor level utilization is fed into a computer model. And that model then has enough information that for an individual patient, we take two or three blood samples, not 10 or 11, and we feed that patient's data into the computer model, and it basically gives us the whole PK profile. So we can do this with two or three samples, and ISTH recommends this as well. And what we utilize is a program called WAPS Hemo Initiative, which is a research-based initiative and allows us to do population PK monitoring. It doesn't 
you know, I think most of the time it gives us very actionable information. Every now and then, I think it's a bit confusing and that's based on the limitations of what the, what we, you know, what you put into the computer and then what you get out. This is an example of a patient who's on 25,000, sorry, 20, 2,500 units of factor and he takes it every three days. Now, in the graph here, one, two, and three. These three time points are what was fed into the computer. The rest is all generated by the computer model. And so this modeling tells us that this patient, if you want to know how much time they're going to spend below 5%, it's going to be 13 hours. That's the time they're below 5%. If we want to know how much weekly dose they're using, they're using about 5,800 units or so per week. So then the computer allows us to play with it and we can put in different uh, you know, dosing and see what happens. So I put in, how about if we increase the dose to 4,000 units, still do every three days, what does that get? And so it will model that now uh, the peak uh, is, is X and then the trough is above 5% and the patient really stays above 5% most of the time and the weekly dose is up to 9,300 units. Now, I can say, well, what if I want to dose every two days and still stay above 5%? And it gives me that information. So if you give this patient about 1,400 units, and instead of every three days, you treat every two days, we'll be able to stay above 5%. And if you look at the weekly amount of factor used, it goes from 9,300 units to 4,900 units. So it's a helpful tool. It doesn't have all the answers, but certainly, you know, it helps making decisions on patients. So the next thing with individualization is genetics. How does the genetics play a role? Uh, some type of factor eight mutations, especially large deletions and some missense mutations um, are associated with a higher risk of inhibitor development. If we know that an infant has a higher risk of inhibitor development associated with their genetics or maybe their family history of inhibitors, we may use some other measures. We may choose a plasma product, let's say. Um, so the genetics do help us in making some decisions. And then certainly whatever is going on, bleeding frequency is a big driver on what somebody's uh, prophylaxis treatment is. And then lastly, individual patient goals. Every patient has their own goals. Whether for an adolescent, maybe I want to be able to play basketball safely. I want to be able to play sports and I want to be able to be protected uh, during activities which have a reasonable risk. For an adult who's maybe have a, has a pretty sedentary lifestyle, maybe the goal is over the next six months, I want to get more active, I want to go to the gym, and I want to lose weight, and I want to make sure I'm protected during those activities. So, so every patient's goals are really individual, and I think it's very important for, for us as providers to understand patients' goals and so that we can be receptive to them and we can um, then address them and try to reach them as best as we can. So um, I'll speak very briefly on non-factor options. And so uh, there certainly are non-factor therapies that are available. And the one that is out and has been for about three years is heme libra. And so what heme libra or emicizumab is, is a bispecific antibody. Now, generally, uh, factor eight works to bring factor nine and 10 together. And uh, what Hemlibra is, Hemlibra is an antibody that grabs factor nine, that grabs factor 10, brings them together, and you don't need factor eight. And that's how it works. The biggest plus is that it is a sub -Q, so it goes away with venipunctures, and it can be given either once a week or once every two weeks, and it really does have effective uh, bleeding control. The other two agents are still in studies, and one is Fetuzaran, which is an anti-COM-3 inhibitor, 
and the other is actually three companies have different TFPI inhibitors. And, and I think I won't go into their details, but the data is still, some of the initial data is quite encouraging, but I think it's a while before they get approved. Uh, they did recently, uh, so, um, and this was last year, um, they presented 400 patients, their pool data on heme libra, and it was quite encouraging with uh, their annualized bleed rate, ABR, of about 1.5, and, and it was nice to see that the longer the patients were on emicizumab, uh, their mean ABR did start to come down. And this graph here shows the number of patients who were having zero bleeds, and that number started to go up. And so that's quite encouraging to see. It is important to know that patients who are on in Libra can still have breakthrough bleeds. And sometimes what feedback we have is sometimes those breakthrough bleeds seem a little different than when they were um, uh, on factor and may not seem as severe, but they do happen. And you can have breakthrough bleeds in the soft tissue muscle or joint bleeds. And if there's a patient who does not have an inhibitor in a hemophilia A patient who's on hemolibra, hemolibra we treat with factor. It's safe to give factor with hemolibra. Certainly, if a patient who has an inhibitor is on heme libra, factor is not going to be effective. And in that situation, the treatment is with Nova 7. We do not give fiber with heme libra, and that leads to uh, a high risk of possibly throwing blood clots. So Nova 7 for inhibitor patients on heme libra breakthrough bleeds, and factor replacement for non-inhibitor patients on heme libra. Lastly, I want to talk about goals of treatment. And I think we touched upon this a little bit, but some of the goals of treatment are pretty straightforward. We want to prevent any bleed. We want to prevent a spontaneous bleed. And the best way to prevent that is to monitor factor levels and keep whatever a trough level is appropriate for a patient. Is it 1%, 2 5%, but keep high trough levels and those really are very effective in preventing all types, but especially spontaneous bleeding events. We want to allow for physical exercise. We want to allow for sports, safe sports. Um, and we want to make sure that the timing of the infusions is correct. We want to make sure the peak levels of factor are appropriate so that these activities can be done in a safe manner. We want to improve many health-related qualities. So obviously, lower bleeds also work towards improving uh, standard quality of life, improving pain, uh, improving, you know, trying to get less frequent venipunctions and infusions, and overall trying to provide a more efficient use of resources. And lastly, really individual goals that are defined by individual patients we really need to follow them, understand each patient, and try to reach these goals as best as we can. And how do we measure these goals? Certain bleeding events uh, are measured by annualized bleed rate. Joint status, we do that evaluation every time we see a patient. Um, and uh, certainly a more detailed joint store can be gotten. And we can image joints uh, by MRI or musculoskeletal ultrasound in different situations. Uh, there are many ways to assess uh, independent scoring in hemophilia and general activity and pain scores. And then individual goals, we really sit down with um, patients and families and talk about if we're reaching these goals or not. And before I complete, I do want to briefly talk about as we talk about goals and assessments in hemophilia, it's very important to look at joint bleeds. Well, you know, the ABR or the annual bleed rate is an imperfect target that is looked at in many uh, studies and, and in the clinic also. But the ABR is mostly determined by patient history and patient perception of ABR and patient uh, pain episodes and joint episodes. So this was a very nicely done study by a group 
that looked at adult patients, a lot of pediatric adult patients, a lot of them with established joint disease and established arthropathy, and we looked at painful episodes. So there were 40 episodes of joint pain, and the patients were asked, do you think you have a bleed or not? And 33 out of those 40 episodes, the patient said, I'm having a joint bleed. And the provider said, in most of those patients, I think the patient is having a joint bleed. But when they looked with an ultrasound, and this picture here shows the same patient with two different episodes, and on the left picture is a, is a joint with no bleeding episode, and on the right picture, this is an ankle joint with significant uh, blood in the ankle joint and a bleeding, clear-cut bleeding episode. And so when they looked at those 33 episodes, only 12 of them, one third of them, 36%, had true joint bleeds. And the rest of them were patients who thought they had bleeding, but actually had pain because of their chronic joint status. Five patients thought they were having arthritic flare-ups and they didn't think they were having bleeds. However, three of the five actually had true bleeds and really they didn't have arthritic flare-ups. So really what we learn is that it's a difficult treatment based on patient or physician perception of pain alone without the use of objective imaging seems to be inadequate. And if we don't diagnose an event, we're not gonna treat it effectively. If we're treating arthropathy and chronic pain episodes with factor, it's not gonna help. And certainly if we're treating a bleeding episodes with just painkillers and not factor or NSAIDs and not factor, it's really not going to help. It's not going to be effective. And so, you know, I think in our clinic, we've been more and more aggressive and, if, and, and sort of uh, in using point of care, muscle skeletal ultrasound. And I think it's a valuable tool to assist with the diagnosis and treatment of joint bleeds and some muscle bleeds as well. So in summary, we talked about that the standard of care for patients with severe hemophilia is profile-like treatment with, joint, uh, with fat and replacement. And for children, this prophylactic treatment should be started at an early age to prevent any joint damage from occurring. In adults, there's clearly a role for factor prophylaxis. And while we cannot reverse significant joint damage that has already developed, we can prevent further joint damage, we can improve pain, we can improve bleeding events, we can improve function. While, and there are many available regimens for factor prophylaxis, and really each one of them has to be individualized for each patient. And really in this day and age, we have multiple effective treatments available for patients and uh, this really can be personalized and individualized therapy. And lastly, I think muscular saddle ultrasound is proving to be an invaluable tool in the diagnosis and treatment of joint bleeds. Okay, that is the end of my presentation. And I'm going to have, I have a brief uh, presentation from Jave, which you recorded. Um, and after that, we'll take some questions. I hope that's okay with it. Thank you, Dr. Khan. Also, thank you to OHF, the president, board, and to Jeanette for the invitation for the Oklahoma Center for Bleeding and Clotting Disorders to participate in the first and hopefully only virtual OHF annual meeting. Didn't quite seem oh, it like it's annual meeting time. We haven't had camp. We haven't had, we've missed a lot of the activities of socialization. Um, but hopefully we can, you know, roll into 2021 with new vigor and, uh, you know, learn to really appreciate the year that was 2020 and hopefully new beginnings. 
Jeanette sent a list of possible topics for us to discuss um, at the annual meeting. One of the topics that she mentioned on the list was problems in communicating with healthcare providers. Um, I don't claim to be an expert, but I reflected on my time as a provider and also with on my frustrations as a patient, and I put this presentation together. So I hope that it's of benefit to you all. Now, some of you may not remember the TV series Blossom that ran in the 1990s. Pictured here are on the left Blossom and our best friend Six. Anytime Six was happy, angry, or nervous, she had this habit where she would talk extremely fast. I bring this show up because as I think about clinic visits, in my experience as a patient, sometimes it seems like everything is all a blur. It seems like all of the things that I plan to talk about go out of my brain the moment that I walk in the door. Doc asks how things are, and even though things may be not well at all, my response is usually something along the lines of good. After a few times of this happening, I realized that as a patient, that there was more that I had to do than just show up for the visit. I actually had to do work both before I arrived in clinic as well as after I left clinic. And so based on conversations with families after clinic appointments, I know that I'm not the only one who's had that feeling. Now, across the spectrum of families that we work with, there are a variety of levels of both comfort and education relating to talking about bleeding disorders, bleeding disorder management, and communication, communicating those things with others. We understand if we have to explain something more than once here at the clinic. And we, the truth is we really don't mind. At the end of the day, we want all of our patients to have really a comfortable understanding with their bleeding disorder, not only in the management of it, but as they talk to others about it, as they advocate for themselves in various places. So we know that we use a lot of huge words that even we have to get comfortable with. I had to look up synovectomy quite a few times before I was ever comfortable with that word. And then I think the next thing to think about, or the first thing to think about really is when does our appointment begin? I just, as I discussed earlier, as a patient on my own, I thought it was primarily my job to just show up to the clinic appointment. But the truth is, in order for anyone to get the most out of anything, it actually takes engagement or being involved with what it is that's going on, if we're going to get any benefit out of it at all. If a patient just shows up and hasn't really thought about their conversation with the doctor or their needs before the appointment, they may find out that they don't get very much from the appointment, or even worse, they leave feeling frustrated by not having their needs met. But last I checked, mind reading isn't on any elective list that I took. Um, so before the appointment begins, I'd encourage you to think about what is your main goal in coming to the clinic visit. And thinking about when the appointment begins, I think that there are some other things that are worth talking about right here um, prior, to, prior to the clinic visit. So thinking about what is it that you bring to an appointment? What are some of the things that are important to you? Do you walk in empty-handed? Do you walk in with questions? Do you walk in at least with a – let's see. Let's see what we have on the list first. So what are some ideas that you have before you get the clinic before you get to the clinic visit or to get ready? So there there's some of the things that I encourage families to bring to the clinic visit. I think the first thing is a personal journal. Hopefully in that journal it gives you the opportunity to write down the things that we're talking about. If there are things that you are left to follow up on, it's a great place to write it. Um, but more importantly, I'd encourage you to come with questions as well. If there are problems that you experienced and you didn't feel like it rose to the level of needing to call us, I'd still encourage you to write those questions down. That way when you get in the clinic, it can still be beneficial. Prioritize the questions. We unfortunately won't necessarily have an hour to spend on all of your needs we may have to follow up on some things or trying to find a time to schedule a phone visit. But prioritize your questions in terms of if I only get three questions answered, these are the three things that I, that I want uh, 
before I walk out of that clinic visit today. If there are questions that you have about clinic bills, not only bring the question with you, but bring us a copy of the bill. That way we can see if there are coding issues or if we may need to make a copy of it as we work with other departments to try to get your questions answered. And, and also importantly, bring a list of your medications at the very least. I don't think it's necessarily important. We get some people who bring the whole gallon size bag. Um, that's not necessarily important, but have a list of the medications that you're working with because the truth of the matter is everything that's in a medicine cabinet doesn't necessarily get along with each other. And so if Dr. Khan, if Sarah or any other provider that you're working with has information about everything that you're taking into your body through medication, then they have an idea of some things that may work well together, some things that may not work well together, as well as if you're having any interactions that helps them get closer to what an answer is um, to get you back on the road to recovery. So bring a list of your medications, bring a journal, um, bring prioritize your questions and questions about clinic bills if there are any. Um, one of the other things that I do think is important is during the clinic visit, thinking about who it is that we communicate with, um, who it is that we communicate with on our treatment team and what it is that we communicate with them about. So one of the most powerful things that we can do as patients is learning the use of I statements. I statements help us in communicating with our healthcare providers because it doesn't assume once again that the healthcare provider is a mind reader, but it gives them information about where we're at and where it is that we're trying to go. So an I statement may be something along the lines of I know that you want to help me and I need to ask some questions. I don't understand why it is that we're doing a, you know, whatever the certain procedure is, maybe saying something along the lines of I feel scared or worried if that's the way that you feel. And so I statements help us to to be assertive in our communication with our health care provider from our particular point of view without blaming them um, for any way that we may feel about the situation. I think that we have a right to be honest in that in our I statements because our doctors really want to know they don't want to know that just that you hear them. I think that that's an important piece, but they also want to know if you're going to be obedient um, with whatever it is that they're asking you to do, whether it's, you know, staying off of your ankle for a week or switching medications. Um, if, you know, if we've identified some sort of behavioral strategy or medication strategy that you know that you're not going to engage in, I think it's helpful to, you know, just let us know up front. That way it gives us the opportunity to find some sort of alternative if there's one that exists. One of, during the visit, the other thing is seeking answers. We talked about prioritizing, the importance of prioritizing your questions. And so before you leave out of there, try to find ways of having the questions that you have answered. That way you leave with a better understanding because that communication is not only for you, but as we go out into the world, being able to live with this bleeding disorder, manage it, and communicate with others um, the way in which we manage our bleeding disorder. And then the other thing is seek alliances. During the visit, you're not necessarily going to get along with everybody on your healthcare team, but if you can find one or two key people that you can call who can help you to understand um, till you can get it to a great place with everyone, whether it be, you know, you may have find that you have a better relationship with the nurse or with a the physical therapist. For some people, it may be the genetic counselor or the doctor, but find someone on the staff that you can communicate with. Because the truth of the matter is all of us sit in different positions as the doctor, as the social worker, as a physical therapist, as the nurse, as the research associate, as the genetic counselor. But at the end of the day, we're all here for our families so that you all to hopefully help to better your experience in managing your blood disorders. Um, one of the other things, what are some things that many of our patients choose not to share with us? We kind of talked about the importance of communicating the medications that we take. One of the other things I think is changes in activity levels and major life changes, because sometimes that this may signal to us that there are other things going on that allows us to screen for things such as depression. Sometimes a change in activity level may be due to injury, and so we may be able to help make accommodations as you go about not only your activities of daily living, but also enjoying hobbies. Um, which is an important part of good behavioral health or mental health um, maintenance. But letting us know if there are any changes, any significant changes that are of concern to you as well in these areas. 
And then after the visit, I would encourage you to review any materials that you've collected. That would be anything from any notes and labs that you took, any questions that you had answered, going back and reviewing, making sure that you understood the information that was presented to you. And then lastly, thinking about if there are any other questions that you were left with after leaving there. Um, kind of going back to the journal, part of the reason I think that that's important is it seems like some of my best questions came after I left the doctor's office and I'd had an opportunity to calm down. But writing back in that journal, and if you feel the need, follow up with us. Give us a call, um, register for the patient portal, and send us an email. Um, but don't let the communication be only every six months or once a year if you feel like there are other needs that present themselves in the in between time. Um, with that, I would like to again say thank you to each one of you for your attention. Thank you to Dr. Khan. Thank you to Tim and all of the OHS staff. Okay. So certainly I'm open for any questions uh, on the, anything we talked about today. Okay. So there's a question on Let's see if we can, uh, I'll share the slide deck again. And let's see, okay. So um, the question is, oh, where did that question go? Do you want me to read it to you? Yes, please, thank you. Um, is it on the slideshow, the graph of children and adults on prophylaxis, why are there fewer adults in comparison, or did I read the graph incorrectly? So I'm not sure which graph we're talking about. Yeah, I, I showed a number. Is, is this, uh, could you text the, um, and see if we can find out, is this the graph in question? Can you share your screen again, Dr. Khan? Uh, I am sharing. No. Oh. It's, oh no. It's not showing your shared screen. Ah. Okay. Let's try again here. How about now? No. Okay. All right. Well, you know, I can certainly try to answer the question without sharing the screen. So, so, so the, the data I, I showed for prophylaxis, so let me ask the question, was it prophylaxis for hemophilia A or B that the question is on? I think it's A if I'm guessing right. Gotcha. Okay, hemophilia A. So, so the, the hemophilia B, A prophylaxis, um, basically I showed two trials and both of them were, were separate trials and, and one of them was a trial in children, and, and one of them was a trial in adults. And, the, and, and I don't remember quite how many patients were on each trial, uh, but I, I don't think I showed the number of patients. Let's see if I can once more try to share the slide. Well, thankfully it worked the first time around. Okay, how about now? Mm. No. No. You know, I do apologize. I'm not sure why it has suddenly decided not to share. Uh, it worked when it mattered. <laughs> it worked when it mattered. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> uh, but you know, but Suki, I can uh, answer all uh, all these questions verbally. Uh, okay. All right. I'm going to try once more. Hold on. Okay, I think this will now work. There we go. Yay. All right. 
So I do need a little bit of feedback on, regarding which, uh, which graph are we talking about? Uh, this is the, the, the study uh, for children with hemophilia A prophylaxis called the Joint Outcome Study. Um, and in this study, um, half of the patients, I believe, were put on the on-demand arm and the other half were put on the uh, prophylactic arm. And there was a very big reduction in their joint damage seen by the MRIs. And there was a, quite a dramatic decrease in their bleeding events with about 18 annual bleeds on the on-demand arm and only three bleeds on the factor prophylaxis arm. And the other graph I showed with this was, was this graph, which sort of showed how many patients thought they were having bleeds. So they had an ADR, they clinically had evidence of bleeds versus on the other y-axis, how many patients had a high MRI score indicative of joint damage. And so the thing that this sort of table shows that even though most patients who had bleeding events had bad joints, there were significant, um, about 14% of the joints that had MRI changes, 14% of them really didn't show any bleeds. And so that raises the question of were they having subclinical bleeding events that we really couldn't pick up, they were still having joint damage. And um, so, so I, rather than go through everything else, what other questions I can answer? Okay. It says, what do you enjoy the most about treating patients and families living with hemophilia and other bleeding conditions? Yes, that is outside the scope of this talk, I have to say, Steve. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I'm very lucky, I think, that I clearly enjoy what I do. I have the privilege of treating wonderful patients. I really enjoy our, uh, you know, the long-term relationship uh, we have with our patients and families. And, uh, and this is not just sort of, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, it really matters to me, <laughs> and I really enjoy uh, being, uh, you know, uh, your physician and, and taking care of this. It's, it's just a, it's nice to go to work every day and enjoy what we do. Okay. Um, any other questions about the data we talked about? All right, then I think uh, I will leave it there. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Khan. We really appreciate your being with us tonight and uh, TJ and the other staff from the HTC, very much appreciated and all of your support year around for our group, thank you. Um, nice night, everyone. And uh, remember, tomorrow night is ladies' night, women's night. Uh, there's going to be a very interesting program, 6 o'clock, uh, same time, same place. So please join us. Thank you, Dr. Khan, once again. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming, everyone. Have a good evening.